everybody. Welcome to a very special Notre Dame International Security Center seminar. Uh, we have a very interesting speaker for you today, and I'll describe uh, him and the topic uh, in just a second. Uh, my name is Dan Lindley, uh, NDISC faculty, and just let me briefly say if you want to figure out how to participate when the Q&A comes around, please go to the NDISC website and look under conferences and seminars, and you'll see virtual um, seminar tips and procedures. So it's ndisc.nd.edu, and you can uh, find that stuff, um, and that'll help you out if you want to ask questions. And I sure hope you do, because this is a fabulous topic. Um, Chaplain Colonel Larry Daybeck uh, is our NDISC Army War College Fellow for the year, and um, he's been studying uh, and writing for the Army on developing senior strategic leadership. He has three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and was awarded the Bronze Star for selfless and dignified service in caring for the spiritual needs of wounded and deceased enemy soldiers. He served for three years as the graduate instructor for ethics at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and helped to found the General Hugh Shelton Chair in Ethics. Uh, he's presented his research on virtuous combatants at the 2012 uh, CGSC Annual Army Ethics Symposium. And he most recently served as a Senior Religious Affairs Advisor for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Joint Staff, and the Combatant Command. Uh, he serves as a U.S. Army Chief of Chaplain Senior Leader and a Senior Ethicist for the Army Chaplain uh, Corps. And if you read the read ahead, you'll know a little bit what the subject is of virtual combatants a discussion about uh, ethics in war, before war, and how to improve ethics in the U.S. military. It's a somewhat provocative paper, and he's not content uh, with the status quo. So without further ado, here is Chaplain Colonel Larry Daybeck. Uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to join you this afternoon. Uh, for what really is going to be something somewhat off the beaten path of what you're used to for the uh, NDISC series. Um, and really to start at the end, at the beginning, is uh, I would love for this to be a conversation for um, great questions, uh, maybe some good answers, uh, but at the conclusion of the presentation, um, please uh, chime right in with uh, with with questions and I'll do anything I can to uh, help uh, clarify the topic about which I'm uh, very excited and a topic for which I'm very passionate. Um, and just as an introdu introduction to myself as well, um, I've been a, a Protestant Christian minister for 30 years, been married to 33 year, for 33 years for um, uh, really more than half my life to my best friend, Kathy. We've got three sons, Michael, Mark, and John. Uh, they're all army officers as well. Um, and I've been an active duty Army chaplain for the last 20 years. As Dan said, I've uh, had the opportunity to have three combat deployments. So the concept of ethical behavior in combat for me is uh, a great passion because I've been able to see uh, good soldiers do the right thing under very adverse circumstances. Um, and of course, there's the, uh, the odd story out, which is not the norm of those who, who do the wrong thing. Um, I really benefited most at the strategic level from my last service in the Pentagon on the Joint Staff to be able to see strategic religious support for really your military across the services for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, as well as the Coast Guard when they're deployed. Um, and the good news is, is that uh, your country provides for the religious, in fact requires the religious support uh, for all of its service members, should they choose so. As Dan said as well, from 2009 to 2012, I was uh, the ethicist at the Army's Command and General Staff College. At the time, during the surge, uh, we had about 1,500 majors coming through the, uh, the Command and General Staff College um, every year. So uh, I was able to influence the ethics training for all uh, 4,500 of them for those three years that I was there. And this uh, paper that I wrote and this presentation I'll, I'll give you now uh, really grows out of that, those three years. And my desire to, to think through what more can we do to ensure that 
your soldiers, uh, your sailors, your airmen, your Marine, your Coast Guardsmen, um, are not only doing the right thing, but they are being the right people, which, um, as we'll see, should be logically prior. So without any further ado, I will pull up my presentation and uh, share some of my thoughts with you as we go along. Um, just so that you understand uh, where I am actually right now, besides being in my basement office, um, I get to be the one Army War College fellow here at Notre Dame for the year. So uh, there's about 250 colonels at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, but they send about 80 of us around the world to get a more broadening experience. And I'm delighted that I was able to um, be selected to come here to Notre Dame for the year. This has uh, honestly been one of the, the single best years, not only of my career, but of my life. My wife and I have thoroughly enjoyed this year and somewhat sad that it's coming to an end. I'll start off with uh, little Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, give you a moment to read through this, but I think this helps to stage and frame our ethical situation here. So I, th I think this frames the dilemma for us in, in a humorous way, um, the dilemma of being or doing good. So cartoon Calvin, not the theological Calvin, uh, when he's considering Christmas, wonders, do I have to be good or do I just have to act good? And as you hear these questions, I want you to think about what you expect of your Department of Defense. What do you expect of your military? What is the trust that you place in us to execute the requirements uh, that the Department of Defense gives us when we have to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic? So do you expect your soldiers to merely act good, or do you have a more internal expectation that they would be good? And then once you, if you land on the side of just thinking that they have to act good, and I'll at least take that, uh, Calvin gives us also the, the slippery slope, that if it's merely behavior, what is the standard? What is the level of good that you would expect your soldiers and your, your Marines to behave by? Should they be really good? Or as Calvin says, to get a good Christmas present, do they just have to be pretty good. So 1200 AD, I think St. Thomas said it well. Uh, when you consider the military and the ethical demands that are placed upon us, um, I love his quote in the Summa Theologica where he says, the common good of the state cannot flourish. And, and I really can't emphasize that enough. That it cannot flourish unless the citizens be virtuous, at least those whose business it is to govern or best at, here in the military whose job it is to lead and especially to lead in combat. We would expect that those leaders are not only behaving well externally, but that those behaviors would flow and should flow out of some sense of virtue, some internal character traits that are inviolable. General George Marshall in 1941 gave a uh, wonderful presentation. I commend it to you. You can uh, Google it. Uh, he, and this is before we entered World War II. So it's, it's, a, it's a solid five or six months before the United States is bombed at Pearl Harbor. He's speaking to an Episcopal school at Trinity College, and he says, the soldier's heart, the soldier's spirit, the soldier's soul are everything. Unless the soldier's soul sustains him, he cannot be relied on and will fail himself and his commander and his country in the end. And George Marshall, as you uh, may well know, goes on to be the general of the army, one of the uh, few five-star generals, as well as secretary of state under uh, President Eisenhower. So um, I think he's captured it well in the, a more current 
20th century milieu and uh, on the eve of a world war that it isn't just about, as we say, beans and bullets and how many tanks and how many airplanes, uh, but it's about the, the human domain. It's about the domain of the human spirit. What is sustaining the soldier? Uh, is it merely just an external list of do's and don'ts? Or as Marshall and Aquinas both well understood, uh, indeed it has to do with the soldier's soul. So our agenda, uh, here's where we're going. Um, I'll talk briefly about what we're not really talking about. That'll be clear in a moment. Uh, I'll try to elucidate uh, what we are dealing with in ethics for the military. Uh, where we should go, I'll, I'll propose uh, briefly a paradigm, and if you've had the opportunity to um, read the PDF, uh, read ahead, uh, you'll see where I'm going with this. And then a, uh, a brief method, or, or really who, who's responsible, whose job is this to take us where uh, I propose we might be able to go. All right, some of these pictures these days are not necessarily as uh, familiar in, in 2020 as they might have been in, in 2010. Um, but what we're not talking about is limited, isolated uh, moral failures. Uh, Colonel Sassman on the left um, uh, allowed and found out about his soldiers um, executing Iraqis uh, and dumping them in canals. And when uh, he found out about it, he covered it up. Um, but as the uh, scriptures say, the things that you might want to hide in the darkness uh, will be trumpeted on the rooftops. On the right is uh, General Ham. General Ham was the AFRICOM combatant commander uh, who allowed his wife to travel around on personal business at government expense, um, and that cost him his job. In the lower right, uh, who General Petraeus uh, allowed a uh, indiscretion uh, in a relationship to um, allow her to see um, secret files. Uh, so uh, his inability to maintain his moral bearings uh, sacrificed confidential files for government security. Um, so are these moral failures? Is this an institutional failure or are these isolated events? And what I propose is that the only way you get to have a good army is to have uh, a good battalion. And you have a good battalion by having good commanders and you have a good commander by having good soldiers. So it's really a bottom up perspective of how do we get to have excellent armies is by starting at the bottom, not necessarily at the top. Um, by forming moral character for all of our soldiers and officers. One example that um, stands out to me the most though, that has not just individual localized consequences, but ac actually national strategic consequences was PFC Lindy England. Uh, she was a uh, military reservist in the Kentucky uh, military police. And in 2003, uh, her military police unit was assigned to the Abu Ghraib prison in Baghdad. And that prison uh, eventually got out of control on the inside. Um, she and others were convicted of torture and prisoner abuse, uh, for which she was sentenced to three years in prison and given a dishonorable discharge. Uh, the problem with what she did was not only was it um, just uh, not a local event in a small prison in the middle of Iraq, but it became a rallying point for our adversaries when they found out and the pictures surfaced for how America, not just one private first class Lindy England, but for how America was treating prisoners of war, um, our adversaries were emboldened to attack us and to um, cause havoc for our military forces. And, and many, many American soldiers and international soldiers died, I believe, because of the actions of private first class Lindy England. In other words, um, this wasn't just a tactical failure or operational failure. This had national strategic consequences. When one person uh, was not well formed morally and 
committed these war crimes. One of the questions that I've asked along the way was, uh, and did a little bit of research into, was where was the chaplain? Every battalion in uh, your formations in the military are, are assigned or at least have a, a position for a battalion chaplain. And so this reserve military police unit did in fact have a chaplain assigned to them. And when that chaplain arrived at the prison to do what I would expect to be their normal job, to uh, see how their troops are doing, to provide religious ministrations, either personally or to ensure that they're provided for people of um, different faith groups, uh, to do an assessment of the morale of the soldiers and of the conditions in the prison, uh, a chaplain indeed did show up to do those things. However, when I believe she got to the door, she was turned away by the soldiers. The American soldier said, chaplain, uh, this isn't for you. You don't want to see what's going on inside of here. I think maybe they were trying to protect the sensibilities of the chaplain. Um, however, most chaplains have seen not only the best of humanity, but sometimes the worst. And um, unfortunately, that chaplain was deterred. Uh, she turned around and did not go into the prison. Had she gone into the prison, I believe we likely could have thwarted what became a, a national tragedy. Um, where was the chaplain? The chaplain was present, but not present. They weren't executing their best judgment in understanding the situation on the ground. So what we wind up with is not just a tactical corporal or a operational corporal, but we wind up with a strategic corporal who can affect how the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the president and the Secretary of Defense do business during combat because one person or a small group of people were not well more formed morally, uh, let alone behaving well. So what are we talking about morally? This might seem a little uh, humorous, uh, not only tactically, but I think morally on, on the left-hand side for uh, soldiers uh, in the making. Um, how does basic training take civilians who want to volunteer and do volunteer for military service, how do we get them from the left side of the screen, uh, not just physically or tactically, but how do we get them there morally so that your soldiers, your sailors, your airmen, Marine, Coast Guardsmen are doing the right thing the right way under the right conditions so that we have the kind of forces on the right hand side of the screen that you trust implicitly, that you have no questions about how your military performs in combat. So where do our soldiers in the making come from? One of the things that we often hear in the military is thank you for your service, for which we're absolutely grateful. It, it's a sincere privilege and pleasure to serve our country, to serve you, uh, to volunteer, to uh, do whatever is required. The interesting side of thank you for your service is more and more American citizens are unaware of what's actually going on. As they thank us for our service, they're becoming more distant from what that service means. For example, coming out of World War II, um, going into the 50s, the majority of Congress had had military experience. Um, reserves, guards, active duty, uh, whether it was World War II or the Korean War, uh, our representatives in Congress understood what service was, what the sacrifices were, and what the real cost of doing business was for the military. But morally, there's another background from which potential service members come. Out of the Enlightenment project, we now today wind up with what has been classified more as a subjust, subjectivistic culture, where it's about the subject. It's about me. I am the center. In fact, who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to say? 
So in an emotivistic, subjects, subjects, subjectivistic environment, uh, moral truth is merely and only an expression of my individual feelings. There is no foundation of shared standards. And so when soldiers come to us out of high school, out of college, this is the moral environment that they tend to come from. And if I were to ask you, what would you expect morally of our soldiers? You would probably tell me, and I'll look forward to your comments, uh, to the contrary or, or not, um, what those standards would be. Should, should we not have a set of uniform uh, behaviors, uniform values, uniform virtues that would be expected of everybody? Whereas on a battlefield and in, under worse circumstances, people aren't making it up as they go along. There is no uh, emotivistic, I'll do what I want because this is what I believe, uh, that there should be some shared uh, sense of moral common ground. So what's next moving forward uh, in this type of cultural environment? Well, we've got a culture that's replete in, in good ways with uh, texting and social media. But what we're finding is that that's giving soldiers um, less internal meaning. In other words, they may have a thousand friends, but really only one or two good friends. What does that give us? That, that tends to give them less depth in broad social relationships. So they'll come from uh, a high school or a college, they'll come to the military, and we have a very intense, very tight social environment where depending on the person to your left and to your right is literally life or death. Um, it isn't for something to be made up on the spot. It isn't something that is uh, differentiated in uh, a moment's notice. Um, it's really an environment where uh, individual connectedness and relationships are critical, uh, both for shared purpose and shared meaning. Uh, and what we're also seeing is a less capacity to handle adversity, to negotiate the gray. What does that mean? That, that tends to mean that when people come to the service, uh, they're becoming more binary. Things are either fabulous or they're terrible. Life is amazing or it's horrible. Um, my uh, personal relationships are fantastic uh, or I can't cope anymore. Um, because of that social breadth and lack of depth, uh, coming to the military, we're finding more and more young soldiers, young officers um, are having less ability to have a, uh, a center that defines their meaning, their purpose, uh, and gives them the capacity, the strength, and the courage as a virtue to negotiate the gray of life, uh, the middle ground, when life is adverse which is really the environment of combat, um, how do they handle such adversity? So where we're going, what I'm proposing is that we should have an ethical army, and uh, obviously that's my branch of service in particular. And when I say soldiers and army, uh, I, I do mean writ large as well, both for the Department of Defense, uh, as well as all soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Coast Guardsmen, uh, but with this caveat, I'm certainly not writing on behalf of the Department of Defense. These are my views and my views only. Uh, whereas in the uh, Army Field Manual uh, 6-22 on leadership, it's interesting, in Chapter 4, there's an entire chapter dedicated to the character of a military leader. Uh, and at the risk of reading too much of this to, your, to you, uh, I'd like to highlight several of the points that really jump off the page when you read this field manual on leadership. That a good leader and what the military expects of its leaders are that they have moral and ethical qualities. That these qualities determine what is right. They give them motivation to do what is required, regardless of the circumstances and regardless of the consequences, to do the right thing. We also expect, and, and again, this is a direct quote, that they are well formed with an ethical conscience, that those, that conscience should be consistent with Army values, we'll get to in a few moments, 
And that enables them to make right choices, to do what is right. And then it closes with this in this paragraph that they must embody these values. In other words, there's an implicit expectation. Not only are people behaving well externally, but they're also internally well-formed with words like moral and ethical and conscience and inspiring others to do the same. So the quandary that I have is how do we get to having internal character traits beyond merely having external values? How do we move from the external to the internal? Well, the Army, in fact, all services have uh, described what their personal values are. The Army has seven of them, and here are the Army's seven values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. One of my assignments in 2008 was to be a basic training battalion chaplain at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And all of our recruits, we would have uh, 1,500 recruits come through every 10 weeks. And we would issue to all of our brand new soldiers a dog tag that would go alongside of their medical and religious preferences, their name, their social security number, and then a second dog tag would actually have these seven army values on them, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage, which by the way is an acronym, LDR SHIP, leadership, to help the soldier remember these seven army values. And it appeared to me that by having a dog tag around your neck, close to your heart, that there was this osmosis expectation that those values would go from the dog tag metaphorically into the heart of the soldier. And we sort of left it at that. And then we take the soldier to the range and we teach them how to use their weapon and really never circle back to what these seven army values are, what they mean, what would it be like if you internalized them and lived by them? And so what? what? What would this matter? How should this matter? Not just in garrison and in your personal life, but in combat. So it occurred to me that what we're really talking about is creating a military ethic, a moral operating environment. And I created a paradigm here that helped me to understand what these uh, principles meant and how to teach them to young soldiers. So a military ethic in the moral operating environment is composed really of, of three principal uh, components. The first is ethics, the second is morals, and the third is laws. And in the military, we also have the Uniform Code of Military Justice which is a set of uh, peculiar laws, particular laws, just for the military environment. So ethics, um, and there's different descriptions uh, and definitions out there, but the one that I've gone with is that ethics are aspirational. These are systems uh, of both external and internal um, uh, ethics that describe who I should be. This is the upper echelon. This is the ideal. This is who I would want to be. This is who we should want to be. Morals, however, are descriptive. They tend to show by my behavior who I actually am, who we actually are. And if 51% of us are doing it, that would be the descriptive morals of our organization. And so I have this phrase in there, close the gap. And that's the idea that if I have an ethical system that is aspirational, that encourages me to be all that I should be. Um, but my morals, uh, if you followed me for an entire day with a video camera and saw how I actually behaved, uh, how well aligned are my behaviors, my morals, with my aspirational ethics? The, the goal here would be to close that gap, if, if there is any gap, and normally there is, um, how to close the gap. 
the floor to this paradigm are, are laws, where for me, I know that there are positive laws that tell us that we should um, have systems in place to support the homeless, to, to feed those less capable, to support children um, who are outside of their families. Um, but when I talk about laws, I, I tend to think of, you know, do not drive faster than 55 miles per hour. You know, do not uh, kill your neighbor. Do not lie. Do not bear false witness. Um, all these other laws tend to be prohibitive. That this is the floor where our culture whatever our organization, whether it's a country writ large or our individual battalion, our rules are don't be worse than this. In fact, if you break these laws or the Uniform Code of Military Justice, what we'll do is we will separate you from us. If you go below this floor, uh, you can no longer be part of the community. So that's the moral operating environment. The military ethic that we're shooting for is to well describe what the ethics of the military should be, uh, how to align our morals, and to ensure, like our first three examples, that those uh, principles, those laws uh, are not broken. How do we get there? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, first of all, I, I think we need to um, educate and habituate virtues um, over values or at least in addition to values. Uh, what I find in the cardinal virtues are better principles that should undergird at least the seven army values or the values that the other services adhere to. Um, where wisdom is, is internal and it's to know it's right, temperance is to uh, exercise it well uh, in a good balance. Justice, how we treat others based on that wisdom to give people their, their just due uh, and encourage to not only understand the right thing and to be the right person, but then to do the right thing. And then I think the uh, theological virtues are also worth noting. Um, for those of faith, about 85% of the military uh, ascribe to classic religious faith groups, whether they are Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Buddhist, uh, the principles of faith, hope, and love are absolutely principles that we can build upon and that uh, soldiers would be aware of. However, for those who do not practice any faith, uh, which chaplains also support and ensure our, that right is protected, uh, we can also build on the principles of faith where we have faith in our unit, faith in our organization, faith in each other. Uh, when soldiers are asked for whom they fight, you're not going to find them saying that they are supporting and defending the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You'll find universally that soldiers are fighting to the soldier to the for the soldier to their left and the soldier to their right. That's exercising faith. They are they are trusting their friends to support them as their friends trust them as well. Hope hope for the future. Hope for things to be better as a result of what we're doing in combat. And in fact, even love, that uh, we are building on that principle of selfless service out of love for one another, love for my family back at home who I am protecting through my military service, love for my brothers and sisters in arms. And then why do I say educate and habituate? A common word in the military is to train. Um, I'm not as satisfied with the word train. I think we need to do better than training. What we want to do is to be able to educate uh, new soldiers to know what these virtues are, as well as the values. To do them, thus habituating them, doing them over and over, and then we find uh, in really an Aristotelian model that we become. We are better people as a result and then are enabled to know more, to do even better, and to be even better. And this principle can cycle upwards. And then one of the principles that we have available to us is the just war tradition. Uh, Use ad bellum uh, gives moral meaning. Why do we go to war? Use in bellow, uh, 
beyond rules of engagement, how should soldiers behave? And then use postbellum, how we win, hold, and build uh, once the conflict is over. Well, whose responsibility is all of this? Um, I, I think it's absolutely society. Uh, a, a book I commend to you is by uh, Dr. Dan Bell, who is my ethics advisor for my program. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Just War as Christian Discipleship. His thesis was positing the responsibility for the just war tradition, not in politics and not in politicians, but in the church. Uh, that people of faith are really where we should begin to train up uh, and educate and habituate a culture of people who uh, believe in the just war tradition. This is not only true for um, back home, but especially for our military leaders. And I think chaplains have a unique opportunity and role to uh, teach the teachers to be uh, the ones out front with the responsibility for moral leadership training. Then how would we do this? I, I believe we should create a, uh, a training environment, an education environment, and then an assessment environment that is difficult and realistic. Uh, moral teaching, training, and education. And to incorporate this into all of the other training and education that soldiers and officers go through. After 19 years of combat, uh, I believe we know well now where that moral intersect is. Um, and I think it would be important to have this moral training, uh, have the concept of being reflexive, not just reflective, but reflexive. For example, when a soldier goes to a range with an M16, they are taught how to load their weapon, how to acquire the target, and how to fire their weapon. And that is repeated over and over so that that ability to fire quickly and to fire accurately is not something that they have to think through. It's reflexive. The ability to get up, to shoot, and to go back down without thinking about what you're doing. That's the kind of training model and education model and behavior model I think would be great for moral teaching and training in the military. And then thirdly here for the how, um, we've also got to be able to underwrite mistakes. When people are doing their best, uh, when there is uh, sincere and authentic um, moral uh, mistakes, uh, that we underwrite those, that those are not disqualifiers. Um, but that's not the same as underwriting moral failure when somebody knows the right thing and intentionally does not do the right thing. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I love on the Basilica where it says, and this is the end disc uh, motto, God, country, Notre Dame, which is near to my heart because that's close to the Army Chaplain Corps motto of Pro Deo et Patria, for God and country. All right. That said, I welcome your questions. Well, Larry, that was a uh, profound, and at least for me personally, a challenging presentation. So. Uh, thank you very much. And to the group, um, I'll be in charge of calling on people in the order that, that they raise their hand. And if you want to ask a question, uh, the instructions are on the NDISC website, but briefly you can just go down to manage participants and you'll see a little button that uh, you can raise your hand and it's simple. And I will unmute you and you can be unmuted for the duration of the answer so you can have an interchange uh, exchange with uh, Chaplain Daybeck. Um, and then you'll be remuted. And if you want, you can show your face too. You can unmute your own uh, video. So uh, without further ado, we have uh, Mike Desch and then Fritz Heinsen. And let me unmute you, Mike. Uh, let's see. How come it covers up your microphone? I'll do it. With a more, thank you, Anika. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. And Larry, uh, thanks for a uh, marvelous uh, presentation uh, and paper. I just want to uh, second uh, Dan's uh, uh, laudatory comments about it. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, you know, normally I don't ask the first question uh, in these events, and I'm only hopping the queue because I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to uh, tell you uh, how terrific it's been to have you as uh, NDISC's first 
uh, U.S. Army War College. And of course, uh, the connection uh, between NDISC and the U.S. Army uh, is pretty clear. And we're glad to have uh, any uh, Army officer, uh, you know, in the years to come. But uh, having a chaplain, uh, an Army chaplain, I think, brings together uh, not only uh, the military piece of it, but also uh, the faith piece of it, which uh, is a big part of Notre Dame and uh, a big part, part of Endisk. So uh, you've been a great trailblazer, and uh, we're going to miss you uh, when you move on to your uh, next billet at Southcom. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, how you deal uh, with uh, what I think is sort of the double whammy um, in, ter in terms of inculcating uh, moral values uh, in the people you bring into the, uh, the army. Um, and that's that even though America remains among developed countries, a relatively uh, religious uh, country, uh, you know, belief and participate, participation uh, in organized religion uh, is, uh, is declining uh, pretty radically. And so, you know, a generation or two generations ago, uh, you could at least count on people who were coming in from outside the military with a religious underpinning uh, for uh, ethical behavior. And I think that's becoming... Uh, less and less something uh, that you can, uh, can count on. Secondly, as you pointed out in your talk, uh, the percentage of Americans who are serving as you're serving uh, as, is at a historic low. Um, and so in a way, um, it, it seems like a, uh, uh, a double challenge. Um, and so in a secular society in which uh, far fewer of us uh, serve, uh, what's the way going forward uh, in your view, Larry? Great, hey, great, great questions. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, for the first one, for, for our new uh, soldiers and officers who, who join us, um, and again, there, you're right, there is increasingly a, a lack of uh, a religious background. Um, and. Uh, although that's not my ideal world. Uh, I'm sure I have a, a personal and professional um, prejudice in that. Um, uh, th that's okay. I, I think as our volunteer army, uh, uh, the new soldiers and sailors join our ranks, um, I, I don't see this as necessarily a problem as it is an opportunity. So um, Title 10 law requires that um, our military provide uh, religious leaders uh, as chaplains uh, because the culture is so unique with the prospect of going to war that we we just can't ask the local priest or the local rabbi or imam to jump in and deploy. So uh, soldiers require um, chaplains and so I, I believe and it's been upheld as constitutional law um, we'll have chaplains going forward. So then the challenge is on us on what role can we play to help form those soldiers um, and, and really acculturate into this new environment that they find themselves where they may have no faith um, or they may be uh, humanists or uh, entirely agnostic or atheist. Um, the chaplain corps is required by military doctrine uh, to have the proponency for moral leadership training. And that's important. I'm not saying religious leadership training. Uh, we have the, the charge to uh, educate, train, and equip the force morally. And I think with these, um, this recommendation to have the virtues as a baseline, um, I, I think it gives us an opportunity to move forward without muddying the waters between um, what is moral and the chaplain leading that um, and what is religious uh, and the chaplain uh, not necessarily uh, leading that. Um, so I, I, I think that might answer both parts of your question, Mike. If not, please, I'm, I'm open for a follow-up. Nope, thank you very much, Larry.
Great. Next, we have uh, Fritz Heinsen. And again, people who want to ask questions, just go to manage participants and raise your hand. So here we go. I'm unmuting. There you go. Fritz, floor is yours. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Colonel, I'm very glad to, to see that you're at Notre Dame. You, you spent a year there. Um, I think this is very, very important. I used to teach ju just war tradition at Notre Dame. And I was very lucky at the time because I could bring in, I had a pacifist readily available, John Howard Yoder. And I was also very lucky because I had a chaplain readily available. It was the former army chief of chaplains, uh, Monsignor Francis Sampson. And I always thought that very important that the students heard directly uh, from someone who had served um, in, in the field, well, in World War II in Korea, in his case specifically, and that the students benefited greatly. Um, and so I'm very glad that Notre Dame has had you there for a year. And your paper was very interesting. I, I enjoyed your paper and your talk today. And there's nothing I can actually disagree with. There's, uh, it, it's that well argued. I was looking for maybe a little more expansion and you in your talk today expanded. And I'm very glad to hear this. And I think going forward, uh, I'd like to see obviously chaplains and the military give this increased recognition to use post bellum. Um, it, it is interesting how, of course, we're asking captains and lieutenants and corporals uh, to, to handle civil affairs and matters that they've never had to handle before. And in, and in getting entangled uh, in, in um, the disputes in Iraq or Afghanistan and elsewhere, they'll have to keep in mind um, use post bellum. And so I'm very, very glad to see you bring that up. But um, there was another aspect that didn't come up. And so I'm sort of curious how far you're willing to go with this educational program. And that is your, your talk has been very much focused around the, the soldiers coming in. And yet now, in the, in the, at the present, soldiers are very much involved in national security policy. And so how do we continue this um, education going up the chain of command? And I, I think in particular of, of James Dubik's book, uh, Just War Reconsidered, because as he frames it, use and bellow is right now, the, the way we look at use and bellow is very much geared towards the tactical aspect of combat. And we should be thinking more and more about the strategic dimension. And well, this is where majors and colonels and, and generals start to get into the national, when they're in the national security policy, they should be thinking or that they should be thinking still in just war terms. And so all the work that you're gearing towards the younger, which 100% agree with, is this something that as they go through the war colleges, well, what if they don't go through the war colleges? I mean, so many will as they, as they go up the ranks. So I'd be curious, how is this developed? How's this developed further? You're muted, Larry. Great. I got to be better than technology. <laughs> um, so how do we move forward across the echelons, I hear you asking. So beyond the new soldier, the new officer uh, coming out of basic training or West Point or ROTC, um, what do we do for the majors? What do we do for the colonels? What do we do for the general officers? Um, and I've also, I, I've done a, a small white paper as well for the chaplain corps uh, addressing that very issue that um, there are chaplains in the professional military education pyramid uh, at every echelon who have the ability uh, or should have the ability to educate uh, at that echelon. So, uh, for example, at the Command and General Staff College, um, that was my job. So as 1,500 majors come through, at, at mid-level, at the 10-year mark, as they're going on to be executive officers and later battalion commanders, um, we're trying to baseline them in ethics at that point. Uh, in fact, when I got there, the commandant of the Command and General Staff College, CGSC for short, he said, uh, Larry, I'd like you to create a curriculum for all 1,500 majors 
um, where they are reading Aristotle, not reading about Aristotle, that they're reading Aquinas and Kant and uh, et cetera, not just reading about them. So I had the opportunity to develop a curriculum at that echelon. Um, and then at the war college level for colonels and, and senior lieutenant colonels, there's a chaplain right now teaching ethics. Um, but where I see a gap is um, once they become general officers and their sole job, they are general officers, is the strategic level. Uh, there's, no, there's no chaplain at that echelon. Uh, there can be, there's general officers, the chiefs of chaplains for the services. Um, the military education is called capstone. Uh, but we sort of drop the ball at that point I, or, or possibly have the opportunity to, uh, to do better. Um, but I think we can do better across those echelons to do uh, moral formation um, with chaplains whose job it is and who are already uh, positioned at each of those professional military education levels. Um, thank you. Next up is Eugene Goltz. Hi. Uh, hi, Larry. Thanks for your talk. Um, I mean, there are lots of ways that I'm curious. You know, I, I hope that we can have a, a, a more extended informal conversation about this sometime. But um, uh, I guess I'm drawn to, to two in two directions. And so let me just sort of put them, put them out there. So one is an empirical direction. Um, so you set up your talk by positing some things about the changes in American society. Um, uh, American society is less religious, um, and, um, I don't know, I felt a tinge of the 1980s culture wars, um, you know, that, uh, uh we're getting moral relativism is taking over the United States and, you know, anybody's values are just as good as anybody else's. And I wonder if that's really the source of any problem that you're identifying. You know, what is, is so first, I'm not sure moral relativism in the sense that people worried about, in the, in the sense that you're talking about, is dominant in society now the way it th seems to threaten to be. Now it's it's a challenge. I don't, I don't I don't have a definitive view about this, and I don't really know how to empirically study it. But it seems to me that people we have a different problem today, which is that people moralize many judgments, some of which are widely agreed, right? So so it's not that people have no values or they think that their values are just an expression of their own preferences, like. In international relations, we're talking seriously about a norm of a responsibility to protect and human rights are treated a different way than they used to be treated. And there's widespread agreement that we can have our different preferences about a whole bunch of stuff, but there's some stuff that is so serious that everybody agrees about it. And that seems to be moving in the opposite direction. And if that's kind of the way people are thinking, there's sort of agreement about some humanitarian impulse, that doesn't seem like it could be the source of your problem. Or I wonder, what about religiosity? You know, society is less religious, but we know the military is drawn disproportionately from those in our society who are religious. And I wonder if the problem cases you identify, actually, you know, I bet you say David Petraeus is not the kind of problem you're talking about, but I bet he's actually a relatively, you know, that he would describe himself as a religious person and he got into trouble. I, do, I wonder about Lindy England. I bet Lindy England describes herself as a church going person, but I don't know that for sure. And maybe you do, but I wonder about the, the where you could take your story empirically. I, I also wonder on the other hand, and I'll be much briefer about this. Um, there is um, something very appealing, um, uh, you can root it in religion, you can root it in American culture, you can root it in a liberal institute, uh, liberal individualism, a set of different ways to think that, um, uh, to be uncomfortable with the idea of the state or in particular the military teaching 
or educating moral values. So we talk about the military as a total institution, which does reshape the values of people. You know, sociologists talk about it this way, does reshape the values of people in the military, but it largely reshapes them in a way that's separate from this question, or it's intent, people have talked about it separately from this question of a moral core that you're talking about. It, it reshapes values to make people willing to kill. It reshapes values to focus on um, the unit around them, their buddies, that kind of stuff, um, to take away their normal civilian values. And it does that very effectively, right? I think of Tom Rick's book about Paris Island. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I wonder if we should be comfortable with expanding the reshaping of people in the total institution to be thinking about reshaping American values given you know, the diversity of values in the United States and what the United States stands for and all of those kinds of questions. Sorry, long question. Oh, good, no, thank you, Gene. Uh, I'll start with your first one. Um, the backgrounds from which uh, current culture comes. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to say that that was, first of all, a lock on where people are. And I certainly wasn't seeking to uh, hearken to um, uh, any pseudo culture wars. Um, I, I think to frame it positively, um, it almost doesn't matter what backgrounds from which people come. Um, so I, I wasn't necessarily trying to describe that as a problem or the problem more as an example of diversity of backgrounds from which people join the, the military. And to your second question, you know, they are self-selecting from a certain culture to join a certain culture. So uh, to your first question, the primary goal is to create uh, from those diverse backgrounds, uh, what can we possibly agree on as a common ethic for the Department of Defense, uh, for me, the Army, um, create a moral common ground that should be better than just a list of do's and don'ts of what to do to behave rightly. And, that, and that's sort of where I got back to, you know, my, my, my cartoon. Um, what behavior is required, if it's only going to be behavior, um, how to, who, who says and why, and should it be better than just behavior? Should it not be character? And I've got this FM 622 that's saying, yeah, we, we think character is important for our, uh, our military. So um, I didn't mean to spend as much time on trying to describe a, a problem so much as to say um, the diversity of backgrounds um, is uh, the environment from which people come and we try to seek to baseline them to serve in the military. Um, and then to your second question, teaching moral values. Um, you're right. It's, it, is a, um, it is a place not only for the military, but especially for us as chaplains, I'll be honest with you, to uh, support those of my faith group, to not be an evangelist, to be supportive of every faith group or no faith group, uh, to ensure that there's dignity and respect for all. Uh, regardless of backgrounds. Um, uh, I think what we're trying, what I'm trying to do is to say, what would, if we need a baseline, what would the baseline look like? So the military, at least in the army, has these seven army values. Um, where did they come from? Why these seven values? To what are they tethered? Um, one of them, honor, is circular. It just says live all the other army values, um, which to me can appear to be vacuous. Um, so beyond values, I think uh, to me it appears that we have an opportunity to get beyond actions to character, to, to the soul, I believe, as uh, or the domain of the human spirit, uh, as George Marshall uh, alluded to. Um, and this is just a proposition to get there. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Anna Ortega Shine. You're up. You're on. Um, hi. Anna, you're muted. You're muted again. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Um, it's very 
inspirational to me. I have three kids that uh, serve in the Navy, actually. So, so sorry for the Army, but. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for being a mom of three <laughs> sailors. Uh, well, it, it was, uh, I think it's, uh, I think some of the things that you said are so crucial. Uh, and and there are a, a lot of different backgrounds that come into the Navy. My My son's roommate was atheist, but you know, he's Catholic and Protestant, if you can combine the two. Um, and they're best friends to this day. So there's a lot of overcoming of different points of view. Um, but I'm very interested in the development of that moral character in, officer, in officers, not only at the beginning, as you state in your lecture, but as somebody else asked, what can be done to continue this in officers? And I'm wondering if there is any type of measure that's used because I know that everybody's evaluated by their chain of command. So do kind of character-based decisions or actions, um, I'm not sure whether they're part of that evaluation, like if someone makes a poor decision and, and how that fits into their yearly, um, I don't know if they call it fit rep, I forget exactly what they call it. There are so many acronyms that sometimes I don't know what they are. So, uh, so anyway, I was curious if there's a way maybe to incorporate it as a part of that or part of their continuing education um, in order to be able to promote and move up in their ranks. Right. That's, that's a great question, Anna. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's an official yes that there's, it's incorporated. Um, I, I don't know the Navy fit rep system or the Air Force, um, uh, uh, but I know the Army one well. And so it's called our um, Officer Evaluation Report or Efficiency Report, OER. And so the official answer is yes. There's, there's a line on the front page of my report annually that says, um, you know, Colonel Dabeck, abides by or lives by the army standards, the army values, yes or no. I mean, it's, bi <laughs> it's binary. So I, I, I'm not sure that that would be more than a pro forma uh, requirement to say um, this person is not terrible. Uh, they're doing on, on, on face value what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but I think your question is expecting more than that of us. Um, and, and I agree. And as to metrics, um, my, my paper is a, is a modest proposal for what might be a way to begin. But moving forward, if anything like this were incorporated, we would need to have metrics developed so that we can say, um, here is not only what moral behavior looks like, but maybe there's a 360 peer review where some of these questions are asked and your peers are supporting your, your, your superiors, your subordinates and your peers um, are, you know, on a Likert scale are, you know, saying where you line up in the seven army values or where you line up in the virtues or, or whatever. Um, Cause that's going to be based on the last year's perceptions of those around you, not how you perceive yourself. Very good. Um, does anybody else have questions? Again, to raise your hand, uh, you don't have to wait to do it, by the way. Just go down to manage participants. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Uh, we have uh, David Gibson is now unmuted. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, this all sounds very laudable, um, but kind of wondering whether uh, field commanders really want soldiers who are asking themselves every time they get an order if that order was just, if the intention was right, if it'll do more um, good than harm and so forth, is it really kind of you know, realistic and practical for you know, that to be inculcated as a habit of mind in soldiers who just have to you know, take, take orders? Wow, um, yeah, wonderful question because uh, that's where it's really gonna matter is on the battlefield. Um, let me give you a, a small example of this and um, it, it might help. In 2005 and six, when I was back in Iraq for my second tour, um, our soldiers were asking, why, why are we here? And this 
kind of gets back to uh, use um, ad bellum, right? So how well do they understand our reason for going to war? And is this a just war? Um, and, and I see this as having two prongs. Um, there's the moral side and there's the legal side. And soldiers are told uh, and required to obey all legal and moral orders. So it is implied that they not only in the heat of battle at a moment's notice know what a, a moral order is, they got to know what a legal order is. Uh, how can they be, you know, you know, Private Smith is not well versed in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, let alone, you know, the just war tradition. Um, however, uh, when things go south, we hold them accountable to it. Um, so what I'm proposing, and I, I hinted at it with this reflexive idea that training environments under all other circumstances, not the moral one, but um, how do we move, how do we shoot, how do we communicate, are drilled and drilled and drilled so that they know what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Uh, I'm trying to add a, maybe a fourth domain of um, how to do it well, how to do it morally so that when you go to bed at night, your conscience is clear. Yes, I, I've taken a life, but it was um, the right person at the right time under the right circumstances. And you're absolutely right. Does a commander want a soldier, you know, to take a five minute pause and really go over the just war tradition? Um, nobody has that luxury, I, I concur. Um, at the same time, um, I think a commander does want, and the commanders I've known do want, um, good soldiers, good in combat morally, and good uh, on a Friday night at the local establishment. Um, you know, that their character is consistent uh, on the field and off. So um, no, no one's got the luxury of that kind of uh, long reflection. And that's why I propose, let's put in a moral dimension when they're going through those shoot houses, when they're going to the range, let's have some pop-up targets that are women or children who are not combatants and they're, they're knowing to discriminate well uh, in, the, in the heat of the moment. Thank you. Wow, excellent uh, question, excellent answer. Next we have Jeremy Graham and then Kathleen Halloran. Oh, Jeremy, you were unmuted and now you're muted again. There okay. you go, Jeremy, it's all yours. Thanks, Dan, and thank you, Larry, for, uh, you know, it's, I think, a, a really wonderful lecture, and it really has been. I'll reiterate what uh, Mike and some others have said, that it's been uh, very much a privilege getting to know you and uh, conversing with you over the last year. Um, I had uh, uh, two points, one of which I think was uh, a bit preemptive by what uh, David said. But, um, you know, it may be worth thinking about, you know, as you, depending on what you want to do with, uh, you know, what you've written and where you want to go with it, thinking about, um, you know, not only, you know, between officers and uh, enlisted that, you know, this application of just war theory, uh, you know, it seems to uh, imply at different levels of, you know, where a soldier, sailor, airman, marine uh, uh, finds themselves, uh, you know, different kinds of training. Uh, and so uh, I think it'd be uh, beneficial to flesh that out because, you know, uh, you said bellum for, uh, somebody who's, a, you know, in the position of advising, uh, you know, our policymakers, you know, has a very different uh, context in some ways than you said Bellum might to a soldier on the, you know, the front lines who's, you know, fighting a war and wondering why they're there. You said Bellum, I think, matters to, to both. Uh, so it's, it's applicable, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, up and down the chain of command, but uh, maybe has different meanings uh, depending on, uh, uh, you know, where one is. Um, and just the second point that I would uh, make quickly is I love this distinction uh, between uh, underwriting uh, uh, mistakes and uh, not moral failure. Um, I'd, uh, I'd consider diving into that a bit more because as you bring up, say, the, you know, the, uh, um, the scandal with Abu Ghraib, uh, so often when one uh, soldier or sailor uh, makes a mistake, uh, that mistake gets exported to the military uh, as a whole, and not just to the military, but to the country. Um, 
And so while I think that the idea of underwriting mistakes is uh, laudable, uh, how to disentangle the mistake from a moral failure uh, is a major challenge. And, uh, um, and, and being able to have uh, consistency of the standards that, you know, sometimes you can have too many standards and use, you know, if standards are, uh, you know, some standards are always being broken, um, maybe because they're set very high, for instance, then uh, it may cause people to doubt the standard itself, even though it's, you know, well-intentioned. Uh, so uh, I think that there's something uh, worth uh, continuing to be thought of there. But. Okay. Oh, th thanks, Jeremy. Uh, it's been great to get to know you this year as well. Uh, uh, go Army, beat Navy. Um, uh, so application of the just war tradition. The, um, uh, one of the things that I, that I talk about when I'm actually talking to soldiers and I, I'm trying to apply it at each echelon where, where I serve is um, given the hypothetical, imagine a soldier has done some due diligence to look into the reasoning for the current conflict they are in. And they are given, based on the last question, they're given a, a legal order. But according to their conscience, they don't believe that what we are fighting is a ad bellum, it meets the ad bellum requirements. So they believe it's an immoral war that may be legal. What do you do? And, and what I try to uh, encourage them to do is to think through um, what's more important, uh, doing the wrong thing and living with um, a injured conscience or doing what they believe is right and living with a legal consequence. Which, what's more important, uh, to sleep well at night um, or to uh, know that you've violated your own conscience yet abided by some you know, legal requirement. So um, I think the just war tradition gives us the opportunity to uh, give soldiers a moral bearing so that they um, can sleep well at night, even if it means disobeying a legal order um, and living with the consequences of that. Um, it, it, that would be difficult, but um, I think that gets back to our, our political environment that when uh, our political leaders do take us to war, that they're very thorough in letting society know uh, ad bellum requirements. We, we have, we're not just cherry picking, we've met two. I, no, we've met them all. Um, and th we're doing the right thing the right way for the right reasons so that Private Smith and, and Lieutenant Jones um, can be in the fight with a clear conscience. Um, as far as underwriting, uh, that comes up often as well because there is a tension and I think that's what you're highlighting is what do we underwrite, Where? what don't we underwrite, um, and, and why? Um, and just to sort of tip my hand back to the virtues, I think that's where wisdom uh, helps us. So instead of having a checklist of what failures do we underwrite, what don't we underwrite, I think when we see new soldiers and new officers more in an apprentice role, that this is an opportunity, or at an academy, or at an ROTC, it's an opportunity to make sincere mistakes and we can underwrite those mistakes. Uh, but if we know that you know that you've done morally the wrong thing, um, those are the kind of failures that we're, we're not gonna be able to underwrite. I, I don't know if that helps clarify for it, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Are you satisfied? Yeah. Okay. Next we have Kathleen Halloran. You're free to go. Good afternoon, sir, Midshipman, First Class Kathleen Heller, and um, I briefly got the uh, pleasure to speak with you at the Rats Retreat, and I just wanted to get your perspective on um, kind of the ethics of, you know, being an incoming officer. Um, recently in a leadership and ethics class, we discussed the uh, controversy with Captain Crozier, and what we thought was really interesting was how he had such a really great intent in looking out and doing what is best, what he thought was best for his sailors and for his mission but then creating that national spark and seeing the reaction and the narrative it produced. Um, so we discussed that. Uh, I just kind of want to know what your thoughts were on that, what the best way to think of that ethically is, especially going in to the military at such a time. 
and also what your thoughts are on the future of ethics for our ever-changing um, ever changing society and warfare as we know it because you know we're not seeing people standing across the battlefield shooting at each other necessarily we're seeing more drone warfare and cyber warfare how do you see ethics changing like that and what can we do to kind of put ourselves in the best frame of mind to prepare oh great great questions and, and I'll, I'll even say go navy <laughs> um so uh with with the uh the aircraft carrier uh which really gave me pause for two reasons. One was just personal. I mean, here's an 06 Navy captain, it's the same rank as me. And I, I thought through, my goodness, what would I do in a similar circumstance? And, and I don't have all the information. I'm not sure that we've got all the information. Um, but he is an excellent example, um, from what I know, of uh, Jeremy's last question. Um, here is somebody who believed that he was doing the right thing and accepted the consequences. Um, I don't know how well he worked the chain of command as a, you know, an aircraft carrier is a significant piece and a lot of people, um, but he has a one star and a two star and a chief of naval operations and a secretary of defense. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's about four or five more layers above him. Um, my question would be, how well did he work the chain of command to advocate for his circumstances. And I think that's true for a new ensign. You know, as you join the fleet um, and, and you run into a circumstance, um, it's, it's very rarely well advised to jump the chain of command, you know, uh, to, to bring it to your 03, who brings it to the 04 and, and to work it up. Uh, so I wonder how well he did that. I, and I really do wonder, I don't know, uh, before that information was leaked, outside of the military to um, a public newspaper. Um, so uh, for the, but on its face, um, if I were him, I would say I did what I thought best for my sailors and I happily accept the consequences, um, if that's what indeed he had reason to. So for the future of ethics, I'm not so sure that we have as different of a paradigm as technology wants to make us think. So, uh, for example, the, the drones that are being flown that are armed in combat um, are being flown from Las Vegas uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So um, the same requirements are for that um, airman who's got the joystick and has got the go, no go for uh, dropping the ordinance. Um, are we attacking the right target? with the right munitions? Uh, are we protecting against collateral damage? Um, and then I think as importantly, when that airman walks out of that secure container and goes home to have dinner with his family versus being on the battlefield, you know, physically in Afghanistan or Iraq or elsewhere, um, who's taking care of his soul, his psyche, um, his human spirit, um, because he's taken life and then gone home to hug the kids and have, have a hot meal. Um, I, I think that there's a moral place for ongoing ethical development that corresponds with and accounts for ongoing technology. Great thank question. You, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Great, um, we have about uh, five minutes left. I'm gonna uh, take the prerogative of the chair to ask a kind of follow up to this. In your experience, Larry, um, how often have you seen people refuse orders on moral or legal grounds? Uh, and when you say take the consequences in the case of Captain Crozier, it's kind of sad. And, and, the, and the question is, um, how often do people who disobey have to face consequences? Uh, does it hurt their career as this kind of standard expectation? Uh, or do, are there cases where an illegal or immoral order is given and uh, some sort of opprobrium or professional consequence uh, happens to the person who gave the order? So what's your experience on that? Um, I, I have had experience where uh, one of my soldiers was um, uh, had a, uh, a problem, won't go into de details, but was um, brought up on charges for a, a moral failure uh, for disobeying an order. Um, and it wasn't necessarily for some righteous moral reason that he had. Uh, it was for a, a lapse in judgment. 
But what I got to see happen for that soldier was um, something that encouraged me. So as he sat on that Article 15 hearing, I saw, and I was there to support him, uh, I saw the commander at the same time that uh, the process of going through what happened and why it happened uh, gave me courage and encouragement that the process is fair. Um, it's entirely unknown to those outside uh, in the civilian world, but the, the UCMJ and a commander having sole authority if there's not a court martial, um, it tends to be, for my, all of my experience, uh, a very fair process to bring out um, those uh, gray areas, that it isn't j uh, as black and white as it might appear on its face. So um, soldiers have the opportunity and the system gives them that opportunity to um, talk through the moral underpinnings for what they did and why they did it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes left for any last questions. Go to manage participants and press raise your hand if you got them. I think Zoe had a question. Zoe, uh, I don't see her right handy, but if you can unmute her, somebody unmute her. I don't see the uh, hand symbol, so she didn't raise up to the top on the list here. Hi, um, sorry, I put my hand down because I figured we didn't have any time left. Zoe, you have to take it, go for it. Sure, um, well, thank you for coming and talking to us today. I always enjoy discussions of morality. Anika, if you can see her uh, and unmute her, that'd be great. I don't see her. Oh. She's asking her question now, Dan. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can cool. see you and hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was actually, I, I think uh, I have a similar question as uh, Dr. Goltz, and I'm just not quite satisfied with the answer yet, um, was that uh, the idea that the rise of secularism or just a slightly less religious society has led to um, less integrity or uh, 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 perhaps a less moral character of the military. Um, I would be curious about how true that is because it, it, it comes to mind that there have been, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, there have been some atrocities that have been committed very early on, and it seems like uh, you set this up as sort of, uh, you know, a gradual uh, change to secularism, which I, uh, uh, I, I think I agree with Goltz that um, people from a certain part of society that is very religious tend to self-select into the military. Um, but... Uh, uh, Vietnam in particular, um, earlier on in the, uh, you know, in America's history, even the Trail of Tears and uh, um, different campaigns, which we would probably label as completely immoral, uh, have happened. And I, I'm, I'm just curious what you think about that and whether or not it's a, perhaps a misattribution of the rise of secularism to some changed character. Sure. So, so thanks, Zoe. What I hear you saying is um, uh, maybe it's not as bad uh, as I'm making it. And, and what I want to maybe circle back to is uh, both with you and Eugene, I, I could not agree more. Um, I was merely seeking to describe maybe the current cultural milieu. You know, if it was a <clears> 100 <throat> um, years ago, and I was out in Kansas at Fort Riley um, working with Native Americans, I would still have the same problems from what would probably be a very uh, homogenous religious environment for, where people are still doing immoral things. So um, I may need to refine this, I'm sure I will. Uh, my point was, was merely to make that regardless of the background from which anyone joins the, the military forces, um, there needs to be some baselining of what the moral expectations are for our service members. Um, I, one of the people I had up there, uh, Colonel Sassman, uh, who was covering up the, the murder and, uh, of Iraqis, his father was a Methodist minister. So I would fully expect him to be, you know, put his hand up and say, yeah, I, I grew up in a Christian home. 
Um, I, I think the point is, regardless of religion or no religion, I think we have an opportunity in the uh, service um, to baseline what the, not just what the military internally expects of its service members, um, both in behavior as well as character, but I think even more importantly, um, what Dr. Don Snyder says uh, in 2009, a monograph, the Army's professional military ethic, um, what, what you expect of your military, that the trust that we have um, has to be earned daily uh, through um, the moral behavior, which should flow out of moral character. That way we can continue to earn our trust, a trust that the military lost during Vietnam, uh, a trust that probably swung too far in the other way coming out of 1991 and the first Gulf War. Um, and, and I think the pendulum may be coming back to the middle where uh, it's a guarded trust, but a trust that we need to continually earn uh, for the sake of the citizens who um, ask us to support and defend them. Um, really great. Uh, we've come to our, our limits of our time. And just let me say, Thank you, Larry, for a truly great talk. And I know it's a little trite to say thank you for your service, but I could not be more sincere uh, and grateful for your work on behalf of our country and uh, for the world uh, as a whole. So thanks again, Larry. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody, you. for coming and participating. And thank you, Anika, for your facilitating.